and welcome everyone. On behalf uh, of the 3Rs team, I welcome you to the 3Rs online chat with experts. My name is Isidora Salim, and I'm here today with my colleagues Rocio Benito and Ljubov Vlaischuk. Um, before I present our speakers today, I will go shortly with our agenda that start with uh, the chat will finish at 1130 this morning and it will start with a brief, brief addressing from our speaker Marcel Holloway and a short introduction of our expert Monica Pier Giovanni. Uh, you can ask all of your questions in the chat, but before we're, we start, I would uh, like to introduce Marcel Holloway from the Joint Research Center and she will tell us more about the 3Rs project and what uh, the 3Rs are, what do they entail. M Monica, please, you can take the control and have your the floor. Thank you so much, Isidora. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today, this morning. And uh, I look forward to, to telling you a little bit briefly about our project and the, the three hours before we go on to uh, our main speaker, which is Monica Pia Giovanni. So I lead the team uh, at the European Commission coordinating a project that aims to bring the three hours of animal use in science into the classroom of secondary schools and of primary schools. Just a little bit about where Monica and I work. We work at the Joint Research Center, which is part of the European Commission. We are a, a research center which provides science and knowledge to the European Commission policymakers in Brussels. And we are based in five countries and over six sites. And Monica and I work at uh, Ispra in northern Italy, which is down at the bottom of the map um, near the Lago Maggiore. And in our small part of the Joint Research Center, we are working on the validation and research into alternatives to animal testing. So these are methods that do not use animals. And we work for the EU Reference Laboratory for Alternatives to Animal Testing, also known as ECVAM. We also do dissemination and promotion of these methods, and we promote the replacement, reduction and refinement of animal use in science. We also do a number of education and training activities, uh, including a summer school for young scientists and the project that I'm talking to you about now, where we're bringing three hours into the classroom. Sorry, I cannot click further because it's covered by the... OK, sorry, I can do it now. First of all, I just want to thank the European School Net and Scientix for their collaboration on this project. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do uh, anything or bring the resources and learning scenar scenarios to you. And this is a list of our three hours teachers who are helping us to produce all the materials under this project. And you will have access to those very soon. And we will, we will disseminate the link to the designated web page where you can find all these great resources that we're building uh, under this project. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about animal use in science. And in a nutshell, this is all about um, using animals, yes, uh, for basic and applied research, but also development and production of medicines, for example, vaccines, uh, testing of chemicals, food additives, and other products to make, to make sure they're safe for humans. Anyone using animals for scientific purposes must apply the three R's under EU law. We have had a directive in place for about 10 years. It's one of the most advanced uh, pieces of legislation in the world for protecting laboratory animals. And um, it's mandatory to replace methods under this legislation if they exist uh, and are available. And we have a strong emphasis on the development of replacement methods in our legislation in the EU. Animal testing on cosmetics is banned under EU legislation. So replacement reduction and refinement, this, the, these principles are really the cornerstone of this legislation. Um, so I just want to talk about replacement first, and this is what uh, Monica will explain to you later. She's going to talk about one of the cutting edge technologies 
that can be used to replace animals in science. So how do we uh, replace them at the moment? We have quite an impressive toolbox to draw upon these days, but we are still developing and still working on many different methods. So what can we do? We can use in vitro or so-called in-glass methods where we use tissues and cells cultured in a lab to do uh, experiments. We can use computational modeling, which processes existing data and um, where we try to predict uh, what a substance may do to an organism. Algorithms and artificial intelligence can also be used in this way. And then we can also perform experiments on small devices using human cells um, known as organ on a chip. And this is the second picture. And this is what Monaco is going to talk to you about later on today. So reduction. So we can't replace animals entirely yet, unfortunately. So then we go on to the, the other two R's. Reduction is all about reducing to the minimum the number of animals needed in in your experiment. And this is done through good experimental design. Uh, and you design your experiment to use the least number of animals possible while still getting all the results you need. If you don't get those results, you have to redo the experiment. And so, of course, you use more animals. So this is very important to get this right in your experimental design. Um, also, you can reduce animals by blending together replacement methods and animal methods in one program. Research program, for example, and then overall you have reduced uh, the animals used. And refinement is all about good housing and care of those animals you still have to use. And you can see a couple of pictures at the bottom here. It's about uh, group housing where appropriate nesting material provided borrowing. Correct handling, like in the third picture, tube handling, is now um, widely believed to be the most humane way to handle mice. And in the last picture, you have some rabbits, and I don't know if you can see, they have hopping platforms, and these are very important uh, to have in a rabbit enclosure, and they are actually mandatory to have under the directive. So this, this is an extremely important area refinement. Um, and the three R's, I just want to say, are, in, are very important for a number of reasons. Um, one of them being for animal welfare and ethical reasons. So we don't want to, to use animals in science. Unfortunately, we still have to do it. Um, but what we, as a European value, which is in our treaty also, by the way, we want to establish a good positive mindset in young people towards animals. And um, in the end, actually, the EU goal is to phase out completely animal use in science. This is the EU goal and it's fixed in our directive. We just don't have a timeline yet for that. We can't fix a deadline at the moment for that. Um, another reason is for uh, good science, good science reasons, better science, human relevant science, um, and to use methods that are, as I said before, currently being, being developed and being used also, but are actually uh, produce results that are better translated to the human uh, situation. So we, we want to move towards, towards this. Um, and also these technologies that we are talking about, including the organ on a chip, represent um, very good opportunities for careers and opportunities for young people in the future. So organ on a chip, uh, Monica is the expert, so she is going to explain, but it's basically a, a small device where we can use, manipulate cells to become like the cells of real human organs and use these in the chip. Um, for example, heart cells, liver cells, lung cells and brain cells and so on. And um, Monica is working in our lab at ECFAM on this and she's a specialist and she will answer your questions in just a moment. But first I want to highlight uh, one thing. So she is one of four careers, professional, uh, three hours careers professionals who will have um, a careers profile on Scientix on the platform and we'll um, do a live chat also. So the next one will be next week. It's Luisa Bastos, who is an Animals in Science program leader for Eurogroup for Animals. And she will be available also to chat with you and answer your questions. And all the details of her profile and career are available online. So I invite you to, to take a look at that also. 
and the other two three hours practitioners that we will be featuring later in 2022. And now I would like to thank Monica very much for participating in this project. It's really great to be able to speak to her today. And uh, with that, I will end and thank you very much and hand you over to Isidora. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Marcel. Uh, now we will continue to our speaker, our expert, Monica Pergiovanni, who is a technical officer for the European Commission's Joint Research Center. And she works in the unit of chemical safety and alternative wet methods, which incorporates European Union Reference Laboratory for Alternative Animal Testing, which what Marcel uh, mentioned, it's called ECOVAM as well. Monica has a background in biomedical engineering with bachelor's, master's and PhD in Politecnico di, Mi di Milano in Italy. And she worked there as a postdoc researcher in the field of design and prototyping and testing microfluidic devices for biological applic application. I will uh, leave the floor to Monica, but before that, I will once again ask you to write your uh, questions in the chat and we will collect them. And uh, after Monica finishes her introduction, we will ask all of the questions and give you all the answers you need to know. Monica, please, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning everyone and, and thanks for having me into this chat. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, I hope uh, you will have a lot, a lot of questions for me. And um, so as we were saying uh, before, um, you know more or less my background and you might ask why is an engineer work in uh, biology? And uh, the answer is a bit uh, is a bit complex because, as you know, biology is complex. So if you if we want to reproduce an animal, which in the end is a very complicated organism, living organism, into the lab, it is important that we mix very many uh, different uh, fields. So of course engineering is one of those because we need to build these new devices to replace the animal. But also other fields are important as we would say. So um, with this I would just like to, to show you uh, what an organ on chip is. So I hope you see it in my camera. It's uh, big as a credit card and into this device we can reproduce specific organ functions. So this means we can have a beating heart, we can have a breathing lung, we can have liver, we can have skin. So depending on how we design this device, we can reproduce different organs into the animals into the sorry into the lab. And this is important because of course we can in this way, have an alternative way of testing drugs and food additives and chemicals, as we were saying. So I think I will just shut up for the moment. <laughs> Thank you, Monica, very much. Um, until we get questions in our chat, you can now commence with uh, your questions and ask what you need to no, but before we, until we collect some of the questions, I would like to briefly ask you what do, what it is that you exactly do in your day-to-day -day life in your lab? What is your job actually as a animal safety and, uh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. So And alternative methods development. So what is your job there? Yeah. Okay. So um, first of all, um, as Marcel was also saying, the first thing that it's important for us to do is to actually understand what is the question that we want to solve. So for instance, if we want to test a new drug and its effect on a specific organ, so let's say if we want to see if a new drug is cardiotoxic, so it means that it is hurting the heart of the person that's taking it, we have to first of all, understand which are the mechanism of heart failure that, that can happen. And the second part will be to understand how we can reproduce those mechanisms into the lab. So when we, when we 
uh, finish this very complex, let's say, first part, that's where we really go into the lab. So if we want to, uh, for instance, go on with this example, we have to then uh, collect or buy from, from some providers uh, human uh, cells from the heart. And at this moment, we, have, we can uh, seed them, so put the, the cells into our organ on chip and start understanding if the functionality of the cell is maintained. And at this point, then we can test if the drug is affecting the normal functionality of the cell or not. So you see, it's a bit of a mixture of work into the office or real research uh, where you have to study the biological problem and also work into the lab when you basically go there and, and do the, the dirty work as, as, we, as we call it. And this is of course not done by one person, not, not done by me, but it's a team of people that works together. Okay. Wow, very interesting. Um, we also have a question from uh, one of the schools that uh, says, what do you need to study to get involved in the three R's field? And what did you study as well, uh, personally, to become interested in this? So um, the three R's is a very, let's say, is more of a concept rather than a career path. So for instance, in my case, I studied engineering because I wanted to actually design and test these devices to replace organs. But there are also many others. Of course, biology is one traditional uh, choice. Um, but for instance, also uh, toxicology and pharmacology, so which are uh, also quite useful um, backgrounds to have if you want to work here. But also remember that we have many other tools to replace and reduce the, the number of animals. And these tools can also be computational tools. So for instance, uh, we can um, reproduce an organ function or a human um, or the human physiology into a computational model or into a mathematical model. So basically uh, all the all the STEM career uh, can be somehow applied into, um, into the three R's. So basically, depending on what is your, let's say, affinity with a method. So if you want to uh, work a lot with the computer and you are interested in programming, don't worry, we can, we can find a place for you in the three R's. Um, and actually I have one colleague here in the office with me, which is doing exactly so. so. So you are saying we can study anything related to STEM and we can then, but even outside of STEM is I understood because there is a big uh, legislative part of three R's as well. So you, we can yes. study. Yes, definitely. Yes, it's it's not what we do exactly here at ECVAM, but, but of course, yes, that's also a possibility. Okay, and we have another question. Um, talking about how many years actually you need to be studying and working in order to become a triage expert and become expert in the field? That's a very interesting question, actually, uh, because it's not easy to give you a number, no? You have to study this number of years. Um, so my, my feeling is that it's very important that you have an understanding on the method that you are going to use. So in my case, I am focused on micro devices, uh, engineering micro devices, and then I went to the application. So, and this is valid for all the methods. So I think that at first you have to focus on handling really the new method that you want to use, and then it will be easier uh, for you to see how it can be applied because it's really a matter of uh, understanding the, pro the problem and the application that you want to face. So for us, for me, I think that, um, okay, so in Italy, an engineering track is five years and three years of a PhD. Uh, I know that in other countries it can be, it can yeah. be different, um, but, but yes, if you want to work into the research, it would be good to have, I mean, not mandatory, but good to have also a PhD. Okay, okay. Um, thank you very much. Those are very interesting answers. But can you tell us also what is the most challenging and what are the most interesting parts of your day as working in a lab 
as a triage expert? Um, <laughs> so the most interesting part to me is when you click start. So I don't know if you, um, so it's when you, um, okay, you set up your experiment, you plan it, uh, you, you start to say, uh, okay, I did my job, I did a good design, now let's see if it works. So in that moment where you're actually starting your experiment, so this means for, for me specifically that I have put all my cells into the chip and now I am really starting to make it work. And that is that moment where it can work, but it also cannot work. <laughs> there is also this possibility that it's not going to work as you thought. And to me, that is the most interesting part because you are, you know, waiting and anticipating a good result. You also know it could be bad. That's, that's true for research in general. You don't always have the results you want. And to me, that's, that's really, let's say, interesting, that moment. So what are you saying that your system is not entirely reliable? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so um, as you may understand, it's not easy to reproduce an organ into a lab, onto a lab bench. So um, what I'm saying is not that it's not reliable, is that we need to understand what are its limitations. So if we want to use it, uh, let's say, as we were saying for drug safety, for instance, we need to know exactly how reliable the data are. So this means that if they are reliable in 80%, when I have to take my decision, I take this into account. If it, my device is 100% reliable, which is not, by the way, then of course I don't need to, um, I mean, I would be 100% sure, but this is never happens, but if I am, partially reliable, then what I can do is go to my colleagues and see if there are other methods that can cover that reliability gap that I have, mm -hmm. and we can, you know, mix the information and have then a final answer. Wow, but is the, the method you're using very expensive? Yes and no. Uh, so, I think here what is important to understand is not only that we want to reduce the number of animals, but it's also that we want to have a human relevant result. So this means that it's not a matter of how much it costs, because of course, yes, it costs more or less, I would say, as an animal experiment, maybe a, a, little, a bit less. But since it's not working by itself, I need to couple it with another method. So then the cost is very difficult to understand. Um, but the important thing is the, re the relevant, the, the result that I have. So if I test this, this is really um, a human based uh, device. So for instance, if I consider, um, let's say new therapeutics against cancer, which are the monoclon monoclonal antibodies, these are really, binding to human molecules. So if I test them on, on an animal, of course, we are, I, I have no result because it, they are not designed to work on animals. So the cost, I, get, I guess it's important, but I think that the result is then more important. And um, the Coliseo Scientifico from Spain is also asking, um, Sorry, uh, how is the uh, how do do industries approach to this uh, organ on chip? Do they are they accepting of it? Are they reluctant to take it? Um, what is um, your? Oh, I apologize. By the way, the school is from Italy, not Spain. I apologize to the school as well. I'm so sorry. Sorry, go with the question as well. Um, so. Um... That's also part of my job because what I would like I also do is to mm, build connection with the end users, so with industries or research centers uh, to encourage and maybe facilitate the use of these devices. So um, I have to say that it's not common now to um, to have this uh, organ on chip into uh, pharmaceutical industries. Um, some of them, they are starting to get them. So this means that they buy, you know, their 
the, the one that they choose from a series of companies that exist and they use it to um, basically to, to try it and say and see how it works um, and this is starting to grow uh, also because uh, other researchers um, are starting to demonstrate the added value of these devices. Another thing is then to, to say that these devices are really used for then translating a drug into human. So for, for that part that uh, in Europe is regulated by the European Medicinal Agency, uh, we still are relying very much on animal models. So there is uh, you know, the, the organ and chip are entering into the developing pipeline for drugs. They are not still at the final part when they can be really used um, as a human uh, relevant tool. Uh, but it's it's a very, you know, a step by step process because also uh, pharmaceutical and chemical industry, they have very rigid uh, protocols, very rigid pipelines that they use for development. So it's it's not always easy to introduce a new, completely new tool into, into the industry. Okay, but then when it comes to the problems that you're facing with industry, with their rigid protocols and inability to change fastly, um, is then the replacement the best option? Well, I, I'm not sure we can have like a ranking of which one is best uh, if it's replaced, reduced or refined. But to me, really, as I was saying, the, the advantage of the replace is not only to reduce the animals because, OK, of course we, the majority of us as a pet at home and has an ethical view of the use of these animals in the lab. But the, the to me, the concept of replace is more related to the human relevance. So human men or, and women are not animals, are not mice. So it's, it's also uh, a matter of understanding why should I test a chemicals for human safety on an animal? I mean, I have different biological background. I have different physiopathology. I have different diseases even which might not even exist in an animal. So why should I test it in an animal if it's not going to catch my disease? And vice versa, the animals has diseases that we don't have. So what do we do if we find that a drug is hurting an animal with a disease that we don't have in the humans? Do we stop the drug? Do we still try it uh, because it's not um, the result is not reliable. So it's it's not really a matter of reducing per se, but also to have a, a data that is relevant for the application that we have. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, I will go back to some questions more about your career and what you do for a living and your job day-to-day -day life. So, um, the both schools from Italy and Greece um, are actually interested in uh, whether or not you had faced some stereotypes or faced some any negative experience because you're a girl involved in STEM and how can we actually encourage more girls to take a path in STEM, especially in three hours as well. So I think that everyone has some sort of experience, more or, I mean, bigger or smaller. Uh, so to me, um, to be honest, it was um, a bit, uh, okay, there were, in biomedical engineering, there is not such a huge gap. So uh, in my classes, we were not so few women, let's say, a few girls. Uh, but in other courses, of course, this was totally reversed. So yes, we, uh, especially when when you grow in the career and you start um, uh, going into touch with the people that are the the classical um, 56 years old white male <laughs> in the industry, they tend to do. You know, it's. It can happen that your boss is the engineer and you are 
like Monica. So he is Professor Someone and you are Monica. And this is, I mean, it's it's bad. <laughs> to me, it's not the worst because I I tend to be like a very I tend to to put myself into the same level of the others because I think this is facilitating communication. Uh, but yes, of course, it's not always easy to go against the the majority of the people. But I have to say that with people your age, so the it, it, this is does not happen. It does not happen anymore. It's not as only a gender problem. I think it's also an age problem. So you think with our new generations, the gap will reduce? That that's that's my hope. Yes. I hope so as well. STEM is super interesting and we need more girls working in STEM for sure. Um, also, um, Liceo Scientifico is asking as well is as, uh, as Anatolia College, they're asking whether or not is it challenge is it challenging to do what you do and do you experience any frustrations during when nothing is working or um, whether or not the organs that you cr create have actually use and similarities to humans. So how is that all affecting your emotional state and does it affect your work life as well? Well, I think that almost every researcher in every field has felt some sort of frustration at some point of this of his career. So this tends to be, I think, at the end of your PhD when you're going to you need to finish up and sum up what you did in the last three years. Maybe you have an emotional peak of what I'm doing and where am I, where am I going? Um, so that's like the big peak, but I mean, it passes slowly. Uh, but on the every, I mean, on the everyday life, it is a bit, uh, it can be frustrating, especially if you are developing something new, which is of course, not going to work at the first time so you have to do your prototype in the lab you test it you understand what's not working so you go back so it's it's like a, a, a circle where you you design something you test it not working and you go back so this is i mean this that's part of the game so at some point you just need to find a way to um, take the best of your failures <laughs> put them all together until they become a huge, a big yes, no, a big success. So there are usually you, there are peaks where you are really, really excited about your results and valleys where you want to, to leave them and change everything. But then, I mean, I, I think that's also the, the good part, no, because you never get bored because you always have these emotional changes. So your work, your job is not getting, uh, it's not getting boring because you always have to face a new challenge. Okay. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. It's every work thing. So, <laughs> but do you have an, some take home, like not take home because we're not done yet, but like one big advice for our students. Okay, this is how you deal with failure when something is not working. Don't get mad, but do this instead. <laughs> well, I think you will get mad. Don't do that, but you will. <laughs> Even if you try not to do that, you will. Um, so what I, what I suggest is usually to um, step back a bit. So when you do research you, or, or develop a new thing, you tend to be very attached to the thing that you have. It's almost like it's your baby that it's growing. Um, and that's not always, you know, the best because you tend to overlook some, some points that are not exactly the best. So one, one suggestion for me is to stay very attached to the, uh, to the field. So don't lose your motivation, for instance, in my case, to develop things, to develop, develop human relevant tools. So don't lose your overall focus because that motivation is getting you through the year, it's getting through the boring afternoons, to the Fridays and to everything. But also at the same time, 
try to find a way to detach a bit from your research and stand back and say, okay, this is not going to work. It's not my fault. It's just that I need to adjust this small detail. So try to find a balance between the passion that you have for science, that something that for me grows, I mean, started when I was a child and still growing, but then try to, to be a bit detached from the particular problem that you have. That's a very good advice. Not easy to, to do that, right? Good, good, better, easier to say that than done. Of course. <laughs> but just a little bit of trying and we can get there, I guess. Yeah. Um, there, uh, the school called Liceo Scientifico is as well asking um, what is the jolliest moment you can remember in your career? <laughs> so, um, Okay, that, that's quite easy because that's when I got my PhD. Uh, well, also the master thesis was, was quite good. I'm, I'm a bit undecided because, you know, in the master thesis, I was working on a very, um, to, to make a story short, I was trying to use human cells as a delivery system for drugs, for cancer therapy. So this was a very, um, a very cool topic and we also found a very easy way to do that uh, but of course I mean I was just a, a master thesis student so it's it was my work but not only because I also of course have a supervisor but when we finished that I really felt that it was a prototype so something that I could touch and I also as I did today I brought it to my discussion and uh, showed it to my parents and to my friends and whatever so that was very very rewarding uh, but also after the PhD I had I have this feeling that it's not only research per se but it's also then how how you translate research into use outside of the lab so into use with other people so it's not only your research but you also have to give it away because others have to use it so also this is i mean it's a different kind of reward it's a, a different kind of excitement because it's not exactly your uh, your own success but it's different because you see that other people are also other people that can be your peers but can also be your supervisors or other scientists are recognizing your success and this is also you know a different kind of of hype that you can get it's not like hey mom you see i did this that's also cool i mean yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know when you go on with your career you also need some recognition from your peers and from other scientists so you have to have the courage to go there and ask them for their opinion which can be also bad opinion but when it's a good opinion you know you have this double um, recognition from you and from the others okay thank you uh, i will uh, i will i have a question from anatolia college from T thessaloniki they are asking what are what is your favorite movie related to science and biomedical engineering that you can suggest that they can watch in class as well and also um, um, the schools um, Liceo um, Scientifico from Italy is also asking because they're connected questions, so I will bind them together. They're also asking, is there any books that you can as well recommend about mm, go, uh, pursuing science as a career choice or to inspire them more to pursue <laughs> science and b biomedical engineering as well? So that's a very, very, very difficult question or very, very challenging for me because I have, I am a um, a fantasy fan so <laughs> I read and watch mainly fantasy movies so that's not I mean they have some science in there but not necessarily um, but maybe science is also magic <laughs> so it depends um, I'm not sure I have a, a question for these two to be honest but um, we could we could maybe think about it and uh, let them know later yeah, for sure. We will definitely con contact them with sending them the yeah, link for it's interesting, session. actually. Yeah, but uh, not easy to answer for me. Sorry. Yeah, of course. And now I have 
a set of questions that are connected to the job itself. So it's interesting questions about uh, the met methodologies, whether or not their work, how it's how they're produced, what is used. So. So the first question I have is from Liceo Macroni in uh, Pescara in Italy. Um, how? No, we asked that question, sorry. So, but I will ask it again. How do you manage to balance your work life with your personal life? You personally, how do you handle it? Um, it's getting easier. So during the, the PhD, it was like 90% work and 10% less, uh, all the rest. Uh, so if you are really passionate into, into science, there is a concrete risk that your work-life balance is not so balanced. It's very work-related. So, I mean, almost all of my colleagues, they were like spending 10, 11 hours into the lab. I mean, it, that was also, you know, we were starting to be like a huge, big family among ourselves. Uh, but then at some point you, re you realize that it's not really the best for you. Um, so what I do uh, personally, but I mean, everyone then has his own passions. Of course, I, I try to do, to take time in my calendar to do sport, like to do yoga or to do meditation. So to do, I book my own calendar time. <laughs> That's a bit uh, um maybe coming from my very strictly engineer um, background. So I have super organized, so I book my own free time. Uh, that's one option. Uh, I mean, if you don't, cannot escape your routine, just put in your calendar, I don't know, reading time or cinema or whatever, and do that. Uh, because then you, you can easily get uh, overwhelmed by, by the work, especially in the lab, because OK, maybe this I didn't say, but the cells, you have to take care of them every day. You have to feed them and you have to remove the waste they produce. So it's when you start your experiments, you have to stay there basically every day. So it's not possible for you to go on vacation. And even if you, I mean, you have to also plan that. Yeah. So if you're not, um, I mean, if you don't take care of yourself, the cells will will like take you over. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, a question that is repeated many times by Liceo Scientifico is, would it be possible to actually create, do you have a suggestion how to create these models, but in an in inexpensive way in school? So what uh, tools can they use, materials, what they can use in order to recreate some of the replacement or yes 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 there is so um i mean of course this will be done uh, you know with color dyes with food dyes you can easily do that uh, you can use the tape to reproduce this sort of um, uh, circuits that you have uh, there are a lot of um, of tutorials in in the web and uh, i remember i was in a conference where we had high school high school students to do that and so one problem with these devices is the dimension so usually we we use them under the microscope um, because of course cells have that size but if you want to understand how these microfluidics work you can also uh, do it do them bigger you can do them with 3d printing for instance which is uh, sometimes available in school you can do them with tape by cutting tape the shape you want um, you can also do it with um, um, with a simple laser cutter or uh, how it's called a paper cutter sorry the the thing that you use to cut the paper and you can find uh, I mean this is a bit of a me mix up be between physics because here we have a lot of uh, capillary phenomena uh, fluid dynamics so depending on uh, uh, you can study the water properties into these capillaries. Um, it will be less biology because, it, of course, uh, the, if you want to put them, uh, the cells inside these are going to be quite expensive and you cannot do that in classroom. But if you want, you can focus on the, let's say, engineering and physics part and reproduce it quite inexpensively. And there are so many tutorials to do that. And um, 
we wanted to ask you if you could, um, if you know them and you have them somewhere ready, could you have actually send us those links and tutorials so we yeah. can actually share them with teachers and sure. some of the guidelines if you have on these things, we can as well share with them. I'll take yeah. a note. Yeah, thank you. Tutorials and films. Yes. I, I am also a Harry Potter fan. I saw someone mentioning Harry Potter in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> we also wanted to ask you, um, so which animals are mostly used in the lab? Um, why, how can we improve the conditions they are living in so they can suffer less? Um, the, there's also questions regarding whether or not animals were tested for COVID vaccines and can we use these chips on organs to test medications and uh, can we use uh, stem cells to test medications to all diseases? That is the per precise question we have from okay. Escola Basica from Portugal. OK, so to my understanding, but maybe Marcel knows more, uh, the most used are uh, rodents, so mice and rats. Um, but I'm sorry, I don't know the numbers by heart, so I'm pretty sure they are the most used. Um, even if, I mean, it's questionable if they are the more relevant then to, to use. Um, and I think that for these kind of animals, there are some, uh, um, some approaches. So as we were saying, the handling with the tubes, so you don't take them by their tail because, I mean, it's not very fair. So you use these tubes to handle them. And the same like for social animals, so which are maybe bigger animals, you respect that. So you don't put them in cages alone. Um, so there are some um, some small consideration that you can, I mean, small or not, not so small, but some consideration that you can do. And also one other thing that's uh, also important is the severity of the procedure. So if, uh, uh, how much they are suffering. So if you have, you also need to, uh, to take care of how much suffering you are uh, asking to the animal. So it's not only the number, but it's also if, I mean, you need to, uh, I don't know, inject, sim do simple injection, or if you have to do more severe manipulation, that's also uh, better to, to reduce them and do them only when it's necessary. Um, but I forget sim this last question. Yeah, I will repeat. Oh, the stem cell, the stem cell. Yeah. So of course, stem cells. Yeah, you can, uh, you can put those stem cells in here. So in, into the organ on chip, you can use them by themselves. You can do uh, 3D spheres of stem cells. So this is a very promising area now um, because uh, it's not easy to have, it's not always possible to have cells that are taken from the patient or for, from our human. So the, the possibility to re-engineer those cells is of course one of the most uh, um, studied now. It's one of the most promising, absolutely. And do you get emotionally attached to your animals? Anatolia College from Thessaloniki is asking. Um, I never worked with an animal, so I'm, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not sure I would be able to do that even because I have a dog, so I'm not, I really don't think I would can do that. <laughs> okay. And do you maybe by your knowledge, we also had the question, do you by your knowledge know if, uh, and vaccines for COVID were, for example, tested on animals because... So as far as I know, yes, some of those were uh, testing on, uh, on ferrets uh, because they have a similar uh, lung than the humans, I mean, the most similar. And I think also on primates, so some, some kind of monkey that maybe they, they find more, more similar to the human lung uh, situation. But yes, as far as I know, yes. But also as far as I know, there were some of these uh, drugs were also tested into organ on chip. So not, not this that I have, but another design. Uh, they were using this device to uh, take a bunch of drugs that were promising, put inside lungs from human and see, um, infect them with COVID and see if these drugs were, were effi efficacious efficient, efficacious or not. Yes. So both of them were used as far as I know. 
Okay, thank you. And we have a question from school in Bulgaria. They're asking, how can you actually for 100% to how can you be 100% sure that your method is working? That your chip is working, that what you're doing is actually working? So I'm not sure that every researcher is 100% sure of something. So we are never 100% sure of things. So uh, you do not, you are not, you just try to optimize this as best as you can. And then you account for that uh, error that you know there will be, and you find a way at least to quantify the error. So for instance, uh, if we have, if I need to test my organ on chip, I will not do it once. I will do it, I don't know, 15 times with different with cells from different donors and I would test it with different uh, set of chemicals to understand if they respond uh, the same way or not, if, if they are sensible to that, that chemical or not. So there are strategies which are basically uh, statistically based. So I, w you do more repetition of one thing, you do it with different backgrounds. So I do it, my colleagues do it and see that there is no human error. Uh, and so. Yeah, we have some methods to to take care of the bias of the error, which are statistical methods. So that's the in the M of the STEM. So if of the STEM career. So if you want to work in mathematics, also consider that this statistical analysis is also. I mean, it's important across the the field. Okay, thank you. And I have two more questions. One is whether or not th this. Uh, method of using organs on the chip is uh, sustainable. So whether or not it's creating more pollution or less pollution, is it a sustainable solution? Um, so these these devices are, I would say, all done in plastics or glass. And since they are in contact with biological material, they have to be uh, put into these uh, special containers, special waste containers, uh, let's say as the materials going on, going out of a biological lab or a hospital. So in this sense, they are treated as special waste. Uh, and yes, they are produced uh, in plastic, which is not recyclable and not recycled. <laughs> because of course you have to be sure that the plastic is not interacting uh, itself with the drug. So if you, if you are testing a drug, you want to see the response only from the cell. So we need to have materials which are more, more or less inert, so they don't do anything, because otherwise we have you know, a response that is done by the device rather than the biology. So from the sustainability, I think this is a an issue from all the biological research done in the lab. So some materials can be re re recycled, let's say, but I'm, I have a feeling that it's a field that is just right now starting to, to go on. It's, it's not the, you know, the purpose of the thing, so. Mm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it, it's a bit um, tricky with that, with sustainability and our new methods. Cannot do both at the time. Yeah, and also I'm not sure how much pol pollution is an animal study creating on, on the other side. That's, I mean, would be interesting maybe to, to consider. And I have one more question that is from first high school in Orecchiastro in Greece, and is how co how can common people actually help this action in reducing animal animals in scientific research? Um, so there is, uh, I think, um, an, a very large call of citizens that are um, active in this field. Um, so the first thing that I would like to recommend is uh, be informed and inform the people around you. Uh, because sometimes it can also be that uh, citizens, common citizens, are not exactly uh, even aware of the number, exact numbers, which is millions, by the way, of animals used, uh, but sometimes they're not even aware of why they are used. So what is the specific uh, motivation behind them? Uh, 
So um, if we are informed, then we can, of course, uh, be active also into our personal life. So I think that also the fact that you are here into this chat means that you would like to consider this career. So you would like to consider starting being not uh, a common person, a, city, a common citizen, but you want to, to do something more. So if you are informed and you can inform and then more people will start to, to know to work there in our field and it will be growing. So I think that just the fact that you are here now, it's it's really significant action. Thank you very much, Monica, with that final remark. That is actually quite true. Um, before we sum up and provide some conclusions, would you have any final remarks or anything special you would like to say to the schools that are connected today? Maybe something to the teachers uh, that uh, I really appreciated the question on how can we do that in school inexpensively? How can we try to replace that to, sorry, to reproduce the organ on chip devices? Because I think that uh, it's, it's, more, it's really important that uh, kids and students have time to um, step out of the books Put them aside for a bit and do some field work so some practical work that could be try to do a small experiment go on into the nature and see how science works so i think that um, it's important to also sometimes stay close the books and go into the real world thank you very much monica i would also like to thank our schools that join us today. We had 14 schools from 11 different countries in Europe. So wow. thank you very much for being here. I hope we provided answers to your questions and that you also had fun while learning. We also today had uh, the pleasure to enjoy a very productive talk with our three years expert Monica Pier Giovanni. We also had a very interesting introduction from Marcel Holloway. Thank you both. Thank you, Joint Research Center, for providing a support with all of this. Um, we also had an opportunity to talk about different fields of three R's, the careers, the tertiary parts, the studies you need to take, how does the work life of a three hours expert looks like, especially for an engineer. So thank you very much, Monica, for providing us with all of this information. And also to close today's event, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all, to thank you the schools, thank you, Monica, thank you, Marcel, thank you, everyone. And um, I leave you the floor to you for you, Monica, as well, to say your goodbyes and thank yous, and Marcel too, if you have any. Of course. Thank you, Isidora, <laughs> for you. chairing the session. <laughs> and thanks for all the students. Yes, I'm also proud of being Italian. So more Italian in science, please. Please, more Italians in STEM careers. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Good studies. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice day and see you next week on the chat with Luisa Bastos. If you haven't already registered, please do register. You already have the links in your emails. And thank you very much and see you next week. Mm -hmm.